I'm Matt Gutman. I'm the interim director of uh, Center for Latin American Caribbean Studies. And that is why I have the pleasure to introduce our speaker today, who is Regina Ann Bateson, who is an assistant professor and has been since 2013 of political science at MIT. Uh, she has her PhD also from 2013 from Yale uh, and an undergraduate degree in history uh, from Stanford a few years before that. She is, um, her dissertation won a national um, award from the Political Science Association and uh, in, under publications, this is the way to do it. Uh, her first publication uh, has already won also a national award from the American Political Science uh, Association. For, I think it's the best paper uh, in the journal, in your flagship journal. So that's not bad starting right off. Um, her, she has two book projects. Uh, one is security. Well, you see V says you do. Yeah. <laughs> Aspirationally. There we go. Uh, well, it sounds like you'll do it. Security from below and from victims to activists. Um, just one other uh, thing of note, which uh, is something that uh, we um, appreciate very much in a policy and academic institution. From 2004 to 2006, Professor Bateson was a Foreign Service Officer in the State Department, uh, stationed in Guatemala, uh, where she did all sorts of things. and. My guess is she's able to draw on it, these experiences in ways that some of us uh, are less able. So please uh, join me in welcoming Professor Bateson, who will uh, change the title. You can see the title right up here. Uh, and so we'll talk for 45 or so, and then we'll have lots of time for discussion. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, so I should apologize for changing my title due to some other data problems. The other project is still ongoing, and there will be hints and glimmers um, of why people vote for human rights abusers throughout this presentation. Uh, but this is a slightly different paper um, on a very similar topic. So today I'm going to be talking about human rights and criminals' rights, um, drawing primarily on evidence from Guatemala. So today Guatemala is both a hotbed of international human rights advocacy and a place where human rights remain in jeopardy. And we have here a photo of Efrain Rios Montt, um, former de facto president who has been on trial recently, was actually convicted um, for genocide and human rights abuses in 2013. And um, his conviction was then uh, basically overturned for technical reasons. And there are now attempts to retry him. The trial's been suspended. Uh, basically, the recent saga of Rios Montt um, sort of summarizes this duality with relation to human rights in Guatemala. But on the one hand, there's been astounding progress lately, progress that sort of back in 2004, 2005, uh, if you told me that <laughs> Rios Montt would be on trial in Guatemala, I would never have believed you, ever. Um, but on the other hand, we know that sort of many of the traditional foes of human rights in Guatemala um, remain quite active. Um, so it is a place where human rights sort of remain um, contested and challenged from uh, ex-military actors in particular. Uh, but today I'm going to be talking about another and sort of much less known uh, threat to human rights or problem with human rights in Guatemala, which is the attitudes of the very citizens whose rights we're concerned about. Um, and this is relatively undocumented, um, relatively sort of unaddressed by the international community. Um, so it's something that I'd like to sort of talk to you about today. Uh, human rights, obviously, is a contested term, um, and it's in contested throughout Latin America in particular um, for decades. So I thought I might show, uh, just to give us a little bit of regional context, uh, this one example, which is from Argentina in the late 1970s. Um, and so what it's saying here is there's sort of the term has gotten reappropriated by all sorts of different actors um, over time. And so here the uh, junta in, I think it was 1978 in Argentina, actually you know, was getting criticized um, for its human rights violations. And so it actually created these buttons and stickers um, with this slogan that they distributed around the country, and this is um, sort of, you know, sim similar to the Argentine flag, and it basically says, um, you know, Argentines, we're right and we're human. Um, so they're kind of flipping around the term human rights and sort of reappropriating it um, for their own ends. And today I'm going to talk, though, about a slightly different 
reappropriation of the term or a new critique of um, the term of human, for human rights that is uh, really very prevalent in Guatemala. Um, and this is the idea, uh, this is sort of my rephrasing of the general argument um, that I'm going to be discussing, that human rights are criminal rights. Um, I see someone laughing in the back here. Uh, of course, um, I'm not the first person to have observed that this is something people often say in Guatemala, um, and comments like this sort of do get made in other um, countries across Latin America. Um, Teresa Caldera has written about very similar sentiments in Brazil, for example. Um, I know, uh, for example, Daniela Gonzalez, who's done research in Uruguay and Brazil recently, and found nearly identical um, sentiments being described there in very different settings. Um, and then we have some other authors, primarily anthropologists and sociologists, who have written about this exact phenomenon um, in Guatemala. But their writing has basically been to state, sort of in passing, a lot of Guatemalans will say things like human rights are criminal rights. Um, and no one has really unpacked what exactly this means or what consequences it has, um, either theoretically or sort of in a policy sense, uh, for human rights advocacy in Guatemala. Um, so in this presentation, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use original qualitative data from Guatemala um, to be a little bit more specific. So I'm going to parse this general sentiment into three more concrete um, narratives. And then I'm going to link those um, sort of work on trying to figure out some of the roots uh, of those narratives and their theoretical and policy consequences. Um, so the data that I'm going to be presenting here comes primarily from my dissertation while I was doing the dissertation research, uh, my research question was not at all about human rights. It was about crime, <laughs> uh, but it was not at all about human rights. Um, but I thought this was really striking that uh, people were continuously bringing up the question of human rights unprovoked in the interviews that I was doing. Um, and so as a general matter in all the interviews, I started asking either at the very beginning or at the very end an open-ended question about human rights, which was basically, what do you think of human rights? Um, and sometimes I couldn't even finish the question because people would get so angry before the term human rights even came out entirely. Uh, people would just start yelling and ranting. So that was part of why I started shifting to doing it at the end because <laughs> if they got angry then we could just end the interview after that. Um, so the interviews are from about 220 Guatemalans. Uh, this is in three rural municipalities. Um, one of the municipalities was heavily affected by the Civil War and is majority indigenous and is, the department, is in the Department of Quiche. Uh, for those who are interested in Guatemala. Um, the other two, depart other two municipalities, um, one of them is majority indigenous, but it's in the east of the country and was not significantly affected by the Civil War. And the other is uh, majority non-indigenous and is also in the east of the country and was not affected by the Civil War. And um, the interviews in the capital, which is only about 20 of the total, uh, those interviews were with um, who we might call elites, um, so civil society leaders, heads of NGOs, um, and some people working in the um, interior ministry, um, for example, in the justice system. Okay, so I wanted to address a few um, sort of questions that you might have about <laughs> how I'm reaching my conclusions um, or sort of what evidence I have drawn from these interviews. Um, the first thing we might wonder about is um, kind of reappropriating some different terms here, but basically internal validity. Um, that is, for the people who I've interviewed, uh, am I accurately representing their views? Uh, some of which are pretty surprising that I'm going to share with you. So here are some reasons, um, sort of why, and I've thought about this a lot and looked back at it quite a bit, um, why I think I can be fairly confident in sort of my representations of the interviews I'm going to be sharing with you today. Um, so the first is that uh, <coughs> subjects often brought up um, the issue of crime and human rights on their own spontaneously. So in many instances, I didn't even get to asking about human rights. Um, if you ask someone about their opinions of crime or policing, bam, you immediately get to blame human rights for the country's crime crisis. Um, so that to me um, suggested that this was something that people authentically felt. Um, it wasn't sort of putting words in their mouth. Um, the theme recurred throughout the interviews, often in various places in various different ways. Um, so even if I explicitly asked about human rights in one place, um, this discourse would get woven into other answers uh, repeatedly. So here I've selected um, sort of some of the juiciest, a few, just a few of uh, some of the most interesting or juiciest or most compelling um, quotes to share with you. Uh, but this was woven through in more subtle ways throughout the interviews. Um, importantly, the views that people expressed in their interviews are consistent 
with their other conversations um, and behaviors that I observed while doing participant observation research also. Um, so I was also living in the towns where I was doing the interviews and spent a lot of time with people while they were discussing issues sort of spontaneously um, related to crime and security or perhaps discussing a particular incident that had happened in their town. And the views that they expressed in their interviews recurred in those other settings. Um, I was asking open-ended questions. And then finally, we might wonder sort of about the political leanings of the people that I was interviewing. Um, I didn't have people place themselves sort of formally on a left-right scale, and that might not have even made sense uh, <laughs> to people there. Um, a lot of Guatemalan political parties don't really have an ideology even. Um, but, you know, I did interview a number of people who we might think would be among the least likely uh, to be sort of critical of the concept of human rights or to be saying things like human rights only protect criminals. Um, and some of those types of people include uh, people working in law enforcement or the judiciary themselves. Um, so people who are, in this case, college educated, well, if they're working in the judiciary, um, or who are police officers, um, people who run NGOs um, who are running human rights organizations, uh, for example, in Guatemala City. And then in the municipalities where I was doing the research, um, I interviewed quite a few people who were um, self-identified, actually, as leftist and were indigenous rights um, organizers and leaders. And all of these types of people either agreed with uh, the sentiments that I'm going to be sharing with you or recognized them as a problem in sort of their neighbors or in society in general that was difficult for them to combat. Um, so they basically recognize the phenomenon uh, that I'm going to be describing. So in the future, um, <coughs> I'm thinking about ways to expand the project uh, to address external validity, which is usually a problem with uh, qualitative interview research, sort of how generalizable are the views that I'm sharing with you here today. Um, if it turns into a paper that's just about Guatemala, um, and one idea I've had is to try to bring in <coughs> some survey data that would be complementary um, and allow us to look at sort of national trends. It's a little bit surprising uh, that I've yet to find a survey, a national survey in Guatemala that's been done that includes the term human rights specifically. If anyone knows of such a survey, let me know because I would love to have their questions um, you know, or their data. But there are some questions um, from some other recent surveys that sort of get uh, views that would be similar to the ones I'm going to describe here. So that's one idea. Um, another idea is that uh, Inilda Gonzalez and I have discussed maybe merging this paper with some of her research that she's done in Uruguay and Brazil, where she has actually very similar attitudes. And then we would sort of combine <laughs> all the interview and participant observation research from the three countries and probably have this be one paper. So I'm uh, interested to know, you know, feedback from you guys, which direction uh, you think we should potentially go in the future. All right, so that's a little bit of background about um, the project and its possible directions. Uh, now I wanted to give a little bit of introduction um, to Guatemala, International Studies Center, so I'm assuming most people know Guatemala is in Central America, um, the war between 1960 and 1996, and since the end of the Civil War, has experienced some of the highest violent crime rates in the world. Um, and, you know, Guatemala, along with El Salvador and Honduras, is in what people call sort of the Northern Triangle in Central America, or less flatteringly, the Triangle of Death. <laughs> And there are good reasons for this. Um, in some areas of Guatemala City, or some rural areas even, um, homicide rates in Guatemala can be as high at the local level as 200 per 100,000 per year, which is um, really astounding. So the World Health Organization, for example, considers anything over 10 um, homicides per 100,000 per year to be an epidemic. Um, and we're talking about rates that are 20 times as high as that in some parts of the country. Um, so that's an important context. A lot of people, have some familiarity with Guatemala in the U.S. As I mentioned, just a few of the typical ways that people have either encountered Guatemala or view Guatemala. So the first one is usually tourism. Uh, has anyone here been to Guatemala, like as a tourist? Okay, that's a pretty common answer. Yes, it is a nice place to visit, potentially. There are nice volcanoes and things. Unfortunately, that's not really what I'm talking about today. Um, another common sort of frame or way of interacting with Guatemala is adoption. Um, so by the year 2007, 2008, um, actually so many Guatemalan babies were being adopted in the U.S. that one out of every 100 babies born in Guatemala was adopted in the U.S. Um, adoptions, and that rate exceeded, or the number of babies leaving Guatemala in those years exceeded the number of babies leaving either Russia or China. Basically, Guatemala vaulted to be the second um, highest exporter of babies in the 
which raises some real problems and speaks to some issues with rule of law and things like that that are tangentially related to this presentation. Um, poverty, uh, Guatemala is one of the poorest countries in the Americas, and in some areas, um, such as child malnutrition rates, for example, uh, Guatemala looks comparable to Haiti. Um, in other areas, Guatemala does a little bit better. Um, the median income is actually, or excuse me, the mean income um, is actually not that bad. Guatemala comes out looking like a lower middle income country, um, but there's severe inequality. So the idea that Guatemala is poor is largely right. Um, indigenous culture and rights, uh, obviously if we go back to Manchu, for example, uh, it's from Guatemala, won the Nobel Peace Prize. A lot of people are familiar with indigenous movements um, and social movements and things there. And uh, narco-trafficking, organized crime, um, gets a lot of attention in the media in the U.S. It would be easy to think that drug trafficking is sort of the only type of crime that happens in Guatemala or the main concern of Guatemalans. Um, but it's actually not necessarily the case. I'm going to talk about that on the next slide, uh, the types of crime that I'm talking about in this talk. Uh, and then finally, of course, genocide during the Civil War um, and human rights abuses is something else that a lot of people know about. And that's actually not precisely what this talk is about either. And I mention these things because um, I actually ran into someone last week who works at, she works in sort of international human rights and has worked on Guatemala. And I was trying to explain the subject matter of my talk here this week, and she could not grasp what I was talking about. <laughs> um, she kept saying, oh, so you're talking about, about human rights protecting criminals like Rios Mond? And I said, no, 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 that's not what the talk's about at all. So I just wanted to um, sort of throw these up here. If you guys have questions about these other areas, um, of course I'm fine to talk about that in the Q&A. Um, all right, so what more specifically am I talking about? Uh, when Guatemalans say that human rights protect criminals, um, the type of criminals that they're talking about is what in Spanish we would call delincuentes, um, generally. There are a couple other terms that Guatemalans use too. And you know, criminals is one of these funny words, and in English we really, oh my gosh, this is, Sorry, I did not plug in my computer. I'll just plug this in for a second. Sorry. You got everything you need? Yeah, I have a cord right here. Sorry, I just did not plug this in. Sorry. I should have just plugged this in. Okay, sorry. <laughs> no problem. we really only have basically one word for criminals. Um, in Spanish, there are a lot of different types of criminals. <laughs> and in some ways, this proliferation of terms reflects uh, reality in Guatemala today. So the types of criminals um, that I'm talking about in the talk today are people we might think of as common criminals or gang members, for sure. Um, so by gang members, um, Guatemalans would be meaning like Mareros, members of the Mara, so Mara Salatrucha, 18th Street, um, other local spin offs of uh, those gangs or sort of imitation <coughs> groups. Um, and then sometimes we might be talking about groups of sort of small, lightly organized, unsophisticated um, crime syndicates. So, for example, a small scale kidnapping ring in a town involving four guys. Uh, that could fall into the category of what people are conceptually talking about here. Um, they're not referring to either war criminals, <laughs> uh, like Rios Mont, or international drug trafficking, sort of high-level organized crime. Um, both of those things are of significant concern in and of themselves, uh, but that's not what they're referring to, or what I'm referring to with uh, criminals here in this talk. Um, and then also the term human rights in the uh, excerpts from the interviews I'm going to be showing you is a little bit complicated, or it's a little bit confusing. So when, because I'm going to be showing you uh, sort of excerpts from interviews translated into English. And uh, when people talk about human rights, this can either mean the idea of human rights, which is probably what we would think of, or Guatemalans sometimes personify human rights <laughs> and use human rights to talk about actors who promote human rights. Um, so people will say things like, human rights showed up. Uh, that doesn't really make very much sense in English, but that's exactly what people would say in Spanish. Um, and so what they'd be meaning would be any one of these possibilities here. And it gets a little bit confusing because sometimes they're not even clear who they mean exactly. Uh, they just mean someone promoting human rights or working on behalf of human rights. So the possibilities um, of who, who the actor might be who's showing up could be um, the Guatemalan Human Rights Prosecutor's Office, 
which is um, a federal sort of uh, prosecutorial office that works to protect human rights in the country. That's probably the most common actor that they're thinking <coughs> of. Um, other Guatemalan government employees tasked with protecting human rights. Um, so sometimes maybe like an internal monitor or something like that from the police who might show up and say, you know, don't do this, don't do that, you're violating someone's human rights. Um, domestic human rights NGOs, so advocacy groups that are often based in either departmental capitals or in Guatemala City in the capital. Um, international human rights NGOs. And then also foreign governments um, or like international cooperation agencies, international aid agencies who are viewed as being concerned with human rights. Um, so in the quotes, people often just say human rights showed up, but that's uh, this is kind of the menu of actors that they're referring to. <coughs> um, okay, so to get us started, um, I wanted to share one kind of lengthy excerpt here from one interview, which you'll see sort of rolls together all the different uh, narratives that we're going to be talking about. And so I'm going to share this with you and then uh, sort of move on to talk about the different components and the different points that are actually getting made in this interview. So this was an interview that I was doing uh, with someone who is uh, a young non-indigenous woman who even by the standards of her rural town is not doing so well economically, you know, kind of precarious situation, and she's basically a street vendor of food, and uh, her father had recently been killed. Um, he'd recently been murdered in their town. And uh, but that wasn't really what we were discussing here. So I just asked her, I said, as far as you're concerned, what do you think of human rights? Um, and she says, well, human rights only came to ruin everything. And I say, in what way? Um, she says, well, in the sense that they support criminals. Today, justice is not done because they support criminals. Um, and I say, well, what do they do to support criminals? And she says, well, now one cannot even go to ask for justice because there's no right to it, right? They also have their rights. The perpetrators, the killers, yes, they also have their rights. Uh-huh, no, that doesn't help at all. Ever since then, she means ever since human rights came, uh, ever since then, things have been bad here in Guatemala. Uh, and it goes on. <laughs> so they don't protect people then. Um, she says, they're protecting the perpetrators, the murderers, because that was the problem. They wouldn't even let us see my father's killers, because they protect them instead of acting according to the law. No, they protect murderers. They take care of them. They took care of them. They wouldn't let anyone go harm them. They had already killed my father, but they wouldn't let anyone touch them because human rights protect them. So we're in a bad spot, you know, because killers are held prisoner just for a while, and they want proof of everything. And even though they caught them in the act, that's not sufficient for them. So then they let them go and they kill more people. They leave even worse because there's no justice. No, no. And it goes on. <laughs> so when you say that there's no justice, if there were justice, what kind of justice would you want? Um, and she asks, what would I want? I say, yes. Um, and then she says, well, that he who kills be killed. He who kills should be killed. That would be good. If I do something bad to another person, then they should do it back to me. Because only God has the right. I assume she meant only God has the right to take a life. Uh, but I would like to see justice done in this way. Because the prisoners are eating and drinking, they even have businesses in prison, they live better. They live better in prison than on the streets. They have televisions, they even have pool tables, they're incarcerated, but they live better because they have everything. All right, so this is actually pretty typical of the kinds of answers that I would get back um, during my interviews. But it's a little bit confusing to sort of sort out what people are concretely saying um, when they launch this sort of uh, visceral attack on human rights. Um, so what I'm actually going to do in this talk here is try to separate out these kinds of comments into three somewhat distinct uh, sort of narratives or claims um, that people are using to sort of understand uh, their lives and the situation they find themselves in. Um, and these are all interrelated. So some people will sort of espouse all of them all at once. Um, some people focus a little bit more on one than on the other. Um, so the excerpt we just saw, there was a lot of numbers two and three here, that human rights prevent criminals from being punished, um, and human rights protect criminals and not victims. A little bit less of number one, um, explicitly. So now what I'm going to do, though, is go through each of these different narratives, um, sort of explain them a little bit, and also give sort of some more examples of how each of these works um, to <laughs> support this broad idea that human rights protect criminals. Um, okay, so the first kind of variant of this argument um, that I heard quite a bit is that human rights encourage crime. Um, and there are two ways uh, that people would assert this happens. Um, so the first is kind of an excess of rights argument, that now people have too many rights, people are actually too free, and this freedom means that uh, people feel like they can commit crimes. It's sort of it's like democracy gone wild um, is sort of this understanding or this critique of human rights. 
Um, a second one, or sort of a second subpoint in his argument, um, is the idea that people don't fear the state enough anymore because the state is no longer repressive. Um, and so therefore, you know, human rights had to do with the state being less repressive, the state is less repressive, so people commit more crimes, so human rights encourage crime. Um, so we have a few examples um, of this type of reasoning. Now, this person is really interesting. So this is um, Domingo. I had everybody choose pseudonyms, uh, so this is the pseudonym that he chose. And he actually is an example um, of someone who's a self-identified leftist, and he's an indigenous rights leader in his town in Quiche. Um, so he kind of falls into that category of saying of people we wouldn't really expect um, to hold these types of views. And sure enough, at first he starts out saying um, that human rights are magnificent. God gives us all these rights. This is sounding pretty good. <laughs> but the problem is that some people apply them badly and take advantage of them to do bad things. And when they get caught, they say, oh, you can't punish me because of my human rights. They take advantage of the concept to do wrong. That is what some people do, like criminals. They use human rights for protection. Um, so here he's, you know, he's an example of somebody who has kind of a moderate view of human rights. Um, this is something that I heard a lot, actually. Some people have bought in, hook, line, and sinker to the idea that human rights only protect criminals. Some people think that there are some good sides to human rights, but that they also either protect criminals or encourage crime, um, which is what sort of Domingo is saying here. Um, now, here's another example. This is more um, sort of on that sub, the second subpoint that I was raising earlier about uh, the state not being sufficiently repressive. Um, so this was uh, Raul, who's not indigenous and from eastern Guatemala. Um, and when I asked him what he thought of human rights, he said, oh, human rights, no, no, no. Now, since that came along, they've not let the police and the military do anything. Because according to what I know from my parents and other older people, when General Ubico and General Rios Mont were in the presidency, they would just grab the criminals, like so, and they would kill them. And there was no role for human rights. But let me tell you, according to society, the fact that they killed one of those people, that was fine, because they were removing a person who was doing wrong rather than good. The military governments killed all those people. Um, so then I asked, well, so if there was a military government here nationally, do you think there would be less crime? Um, and he says, oh, yes, yes. That's why now, how can I even explain it? People are yearning for uh, General Otto Perez Molina to reach the presidency, because he's a military man. Um, and lo and behold, he is. This, this was done before uh, the election. He was then elected, and he's now president uh, of Guatemala. This also relates to the uh, other project that I'm doing. <laughs> I told you there would be glimmers of the other project in this project. Um, all right, and so these are just two examples um, of the types of answers that I heard uh, fairly typically throughout the interviews um, in kind of this first area. Um, so the second narrative um, that I've sort of parsed out is the idea that human rights prevent criminals from being punished. Um, and there are a couple, again, a couple different variants of this, or like logical points that often fall into this argument. So the first is that human rights literally prevent law enforcement from catching criminals. Um, so this is people saying essentially like, you've got criminals, you've got police, you've got the judiciary, and human rights are the thing that are preventing the police from going and getting the criminals, or from processing them and prosecuting them um, effectively. A sort of a second variant of this is the idea that human rights advocates are skilled at getting criminals released on technicalities. Um, so a lot of people have the perception that human rights advocates are really well educated, um, they're really passionate, they have a lot of resources relative to other local actors, um, they have a lot of time on their hands, they really know the law, and so they're really adept at like manipulating the system um, in a way that prosecutors aren't just the perception. Um, I should also add that I don't necessarily endorse any of these views. I'm just sharing other people's views with you. Um, and then finally, uh, people will often say things along the lines of uh, that human rights don't allow for sufficiently severe punishment of criminals. Um, and so we'll see some examples, but this would be essentially um, the idea that, well, uh, if someone tries to lynch a thief or kill a criminal or something like that, human rights or human rights um, advocates will show up and will stop them from doing it. So therefore, there's not sufficient deterrence, um, and there's not sufficient punishment of criminals. So I'm going to go through again some examples um, that relate to each of these different points here. Um, so you often get, I would say that the general concept that human rights prevent criminals from being punished is the most common sort of variant of human rights or criminals' rights that I would hear. Um, and so you often get like very general sorts of statements along these lines. So these are just some examples. Um, you know, oh, here with human rights, now it's not possible to get justice. Human rights come and help the criminal. Um, human rights are bad because they go around defending bad guys, thieves, murderers. 
human rights only serve to protect criminals. Um, so these are fairly vague statements. And then in some cases, I was able to get people to sort of elaborate, like, what do you actually mean um, when you say they're protecting criminals? How do they do that? <laughs> what tools do they use? Um, these were the kinds of questions I was asking to try to get people to be more concrete um, in their interviews. And uh, so here's one example. This is someone from uh, Kiche who is who's not indigenous. Um, so Ronnie explains to us, he says, well, the person goes to prison a ton of times, and because of human rights, they cannot find him again more thoroughly. The killer goes, kills someone, goes to prison for a few years, and gets out because then someone who works on human rights intervenes. Um, so this is that idea that like, human rights advocates are basically either preventing people from being tried or getting them out of jail. Um, now, Alex here is interesting because he works for the judiciary. Um, so he's explaining, well, human rights are very good in the sense that they protect the constitutional rights of the citizens, right? all people who live in the Republic of Guatemala. The only exception, or the bad thing I see in human rights, or the human rights prosecutor's office, um, is that they've been looking out more for the interests of criminals. The criminals commit their criminal acts, and the police come, they capture them, and the first thing they, he means the, uh, the alleged criminals, say is that this is an illegal arrest because they haven't done anything, and then they say, the criminals always say, that the first thing they're going to do is go and complain to human rights. This makes policing difficult. Um, so this is more the sense that that they are literally, human rights are literally preventing the police from um, detaining people and keeping them in detention. Um, then we have Ronnie again. This is actually all one uh, long statement um, from him. I just separated it out to try to make it a little bit clearer. Um, this is like that last point, uh, basically, that the idea of human rights or human <coughs> rights actors prevent people from punishing criminals in the way that they would like to punish them. Um, so he says, well, if you want to do something to a criminal, human rights will not agree with it. If you want to make something happen in a situation where it's necessary to carry out justice, human rights will come and say no because this and that and no, no, no. So many people do not agree with them. And then Carlos, who is from the same town, is a little more explicit. He says, if we kill a thief here, human rights and a ton of international institutions will come. Um, and presumably what he meant was like come and give people a hard time. Um, so this is basically, you know, as what, what my dissertation is really about is um, about lynchings and other forms of vigilantism in Guatemala, um, which are very, very, very common. And so essentially what both people here are saying is that uh, human rights won't let them carry out vigilantism in the way that they would like, or criticizes it when they do. Um, and then the third narrative that is sort of embedded in the broader critique of human rights um, as criminals' rights is the idea that human rights protect criminals and not victims. Um, this is a little bit different than the other two areas uh, that I shared with you. So some of the sort of substantive points that people tend to make um, in this narrative are the idea that good people deserve rights and bad people don't, uh, that human, right ad human rights advocates work to protect the rights of criminals, and human rights advocates don't work on behalf of victims of crimes. Um, and we'll see some of there is a little bit more relationship to reality, at least in the last point there. Um, so I'll discuss each of those with you guys in a little bit more detail. Um, so first, this is getting to the idea of sort of good, uh, good people and bad people, and who deserves rights or assistance. Um, so we have Anna. Uh, she says human rights have come and upset everything. That's actually pretty common. I mean, you guys may have noticed even in the excerpts that I've been sharing, and this is just a small sample of the 200 plus interviews. Literally verbatim saying human rights have come and upset everything. Um, very common way of starting the answers to this question. Okay, so human rights have come and upset everything because now it's not about the rights of the citizen, the person who's doing good, uh, but rather rights are for criminals. And implicitly she's saying criminals are not citizens, um, which is really interesting. Uh, then we have Jesus, who is another example, actually, of somebody who <coughs> self-identifies as a human rights activist, actually. Um, so he's also indigenous and from Quiche, and he's really interesting. This is a good, I think, illustration of how um, participant observation combined with interviews is um, sometimes it gives us more information than just doing interviews by themselves. Because I spent some time with Jesus and I've been to his house and I've talked to him in other settings. Um, this is someone who owns several books by Rigoberto Menchu. This is someone who has been to a human rights training uh, conducted by UNICEF. Um, and the man actually has a copy of a training manual related to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in his house. <laughs> and this is not a luxurious house. I mean, this is um, like his whole collection of books. It's basically the Rigoberto Menchu books and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So the more I got to know Jesus, I thought, surely this will be someone um, who wholeheartedly does not have really any critique of human rights. And yet, 
Um, so here's Jesus' take. He says, well, human rights should work for both sides. They should be balanced. But a large part of the population is left unprotected. When there's a rape, an assault, a kidnapping, where are they? Where are human rights? Um, and what he means is, for the victim, where are human rights? Where are the human rights activists? Why aren't they there helping the victim? Um, and then this is uh, sort of a really interesting excerpt that gets um, to the idea of who deserves rights or doesn't. Um, so Guillermo was saying, well, I think human rights should exist, but they should stick to doing their job, which is not so much to protect criminals, but rather to be the protectors of the people so that their human rights are not violated. I would like to see human rights protect those people who really deserve protection. That's all. Um, and then I asked, well, what if they say that everyone deserves protection? Um, so the idea of universal human rights. Um, and Guillermo says, I think that not everyone deserves protection. That's my personal opinion. What protection does someone deserve when he's killed six, seven people? Um, this was a really common objection that I heard, um, just basically a wholehearted disagreement with the idea of universal human rights. <coughs> Okay, and then this is um, actually someone else who works in law enforcement um, at a fairly high level in one of these rural towns. Um, and he's got sort of a, a nuanced opinion here. He's kind of analyzing um, some of the other views that I've shared with you. So he says, I think that human rights are good. They're good, but the information is misunderstood by the public. The public, what they see is that the people who go around fighting for human rights, the state authorities, they defend the criminals more than the person who is the victim. And that is really what they see. What happens is the judicial system has to respect the rights of the people. And the truth is that we forget the victims sometimes as judicial officials. We forget the victim. We realize that we have to tell the person accused of the crime that they have the right to this and that and these guarantees, and the victim is just left by the wayside. It shouldn't be that way. And so we perhaps see, I mean, in a place with a very high um, impunity rate and really no victim services um, at all, there are perhaps some glimmers of reality, uh, at least underpinning some of these attitudes in this latter category. Um, and it's important to note, sort of, for the context, for putting this um, in context, and as I was mentioning earlier, rates of violent crime are very high in Guatemala, so there aren't really any credible national victimization surveys. Um, but one recent victimization survey in Guatemala City found that in a third of households, someone had been the victim of a violent crime in the last year. And that's a violent crime. Um, basically everyone has either been the victim of a serious crime recently or knows someone who has been. Um, and so I think it's fairly accurate to say that people see themselves as, um, well I sort of like this quote here, um, which is from uh, Susanna Rodker from something she wrote in 2002 actually about Venezuela. Um, but it's basically the idea of uh, potential victims. But a lot of, I'm using it here to apply to Guatemala. But I'd say that a lot of Guatemalans see themselves as potential victims. Um, the way she explains the potential victims is someone who could be killed at any moment because they fetch a big ransom, because they wear brand new shoes, or because the assailant who made a bet with his friends fired his gun by mistake. The potential victim is middle class, wealthy, or poor. It's anyone who goes out and is afraid, afraid because everything is rotting and out of control, because there is no control, because no one believes in anything anymore. Um, and when you're in this kind of environment, if people buy into sort of a rhetoric that human rights protect criminals and not victims, and virtually everyone views themselves as a potential victim, then you know a huge percentage of the population is finding themselves sort of alienated from the idea of human rights, and thinking that human rights doesn't apply to them. Um, so I think this last area is really fairly significant. Okay, so what do I think are some of the root uh, sort of problems underlying uh, the whole discourse that I presented to you here today? Um, I think that absolutely impunity and high rates of violent crime, but especially combined with impunity, really underlie a lot of the frustrations. Um, and that's often sort of the topic that people are linking their critique of human rights to. Um, you know, the conviction rate, um, I mean, I think it was in, oh gosh, it was either in 2008 or 2005, uh, one of those two years, but recently, I mean, there was a year in which there were over 5,000 murders in Guatemala and eight convictions for murder. Um, so the conviction rate even for homicide is usually somewhere between 1 and 3% um, per year. And for other crimes, most people don't even uh, report them to the police. If you look at crime data from Guatemala, you see a really strange anomaly where usually other types of crimes are a lot more prevalent than homicide. Um, but in Guatemala, like property crimes and that aren't even getting reported. Um, so just vast, 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 massive um, rates of impunity. I mean, as the um, UN Special Rapporteur said recently, you know, Guatemala is a good place to get, commit murder because they probably get away with it. Um, and that's absolutely true. Um, so the second big area, I think, is lack of support for victims. Um, that this is, again, a huge percentage of the population 
Um, I was really struck when I was doing the interviews that I wasn't actually seeking to find out information about people's own personal experiences with uh, crime victimization and violent crime. And a lot of people insisted on bringing up recent serious crimes that had happened to them and um, really insisted on framing their experiences, presenting themselves as a victim of violent crime. So this is an identity that a lot of people sort of feel that they have. Um, I mean, you know, typically I would start um, my interviews for my dissertation research just with a question, when and where were you born? And I had at least five people respond to that question by telling me things like, well, my husband was murdered last year. Um, so this is really a very, um, the idea of being a victim or a potential victim, um, very salient, almost no support for them. Um, and yeah, I mean, so Rose's family, for example, who we saw the quote from in the beginning, um, they had to sort of work really hard to even find the body of the person who had been murdered, um, got no updates about the case, um, and it's really a very difficult system. Um, it's, it is difficult for me to ascertain often what has happened to a case in Guatemala. Um, so for people who aren't used to dealing with um, the judicial system or sort of managing complex documents, I think it's almost impossible to figure out really um, what's happening to your case. And there's really no uh, victim support services in the way that we might think of in the United States, um, such as compensation or counseling or things like that. Um, lack of knowledge about due process, sort of combined with distrust of law enforcement and the state. Um, and we know that levels of trust in place in Guatemala are very, very low. Um, and this sort of lack of knowledge, lack of understanding, lack of patience, um, this was something that a lot of the uh, sort of judicial officials and people in uh, the law enforcement sector that I interviewed flagged and one of the frustrations that leads people to then blame sort of human rights for the problems of crime in the country. Um, so people sometimes honestly don't understand why someone might be detained and then be released and then be called back for their trial or um, you know, some of the evidentiary standards that the legal system has. Um, and then finally, of course, there's the historic vilification of human rights in Guatemala. Um, so this is sort of a term that in Guatemala um, people are sort of primed to associate with um, all sorts of negative actors. Um, and I mean, during the era of the Civil War, uh, I mean, the government was quite uh, aggressive and vociferous in denouncing and criticizing um, human rights advocates. And in many cases, actually, even calling the human, calling the human rights community themselves either terrorists or criminals, delinquentes. Um, so this sort of mashing up, this is not the exact same, it's not that people are spouting out the exact same rhetoric again, um, but the notion that there's some association between human rights and criminals, um, or that human rights could be somehow advocating uh, for criminals, um, some of the roots of that were planted during the Civil War. Uh, okay, so what are some of the consequences uh, of these attitudes? I mean, one of the biggest sort of immediate consequences is hostility toward human rights advocates and the idea of human rights. Um, and as I was mentioning, sometimes in the interviews, if I made the mistake of mentioning the term human rights too early in the interview, people would get really angry and sort of go off on these diatribes. Um, so this is something that makes it really difficult to do training, do education, address some of the problems I mentioned on the first slide, because if you can't even discuss a concept, um, because it's, been, it's become so polarized and uh, sort of gets people so angry, then where do you even start? Um, and there's real hostility toward human rights advocates. Um, I mean, some of that is sort of related to all the other political conflicts in the country, um, but some of it is related to this feeling that they're protecting criminals. Um, so sometimes when people try to intervene to stop a lynching, for example, um, these attitudes can be behind some attacks on human rights advocates. Um, further dehumanization of alleged criminals, um, the dehumanization in particular of um, alleged gang members in Guatemala is kind of legendary. <laughs> You know, uh, town security committees will even put up these caricatures of gang members with tattoos um, behind bars and things like that. Um, so, and this is a country with a, a strong history of dehumanization um, and, in fact, of genocide. Uh, and so this is sort of keeping alive those ideas, albeit with a different target, um, in this case criminals. Uh, obviously rejection of the idea of universal rights, um, you know, this is sort of the whole rhetoric that some people deserve rights and other people don't. It's very contradictory to the idea of universal rights. Uh, further weakening of trust in law enforcement and in <coughs> democratic state institutions um, to the extent that sort of law enforcement and state uh, sort of like the, the human rights prosecutor's office um, are being seen as protecting criminals and not victims. That leads people to trust them even less. 
than they already do. Um, so some of these things are kind of circular. And uh, support for vigilantism, uh, which I've talked about in my other work. And then, in some cases, support uh, for military government or mano dura, which is basically very harsh uh, policing tactics. Uh, domestic human rights groups, uh, by which I mean human rights groups based in Guatemala, staffed by Guatemalans, tend to be very aware um, of this discourse, and they actively work to address its root causes. Um, so it was really you know, interesting when I did interviews with uh, people who run human rights NGOs in Guatemala City. If I even mentioned, you know, I would ask them things like, do you have problems with people saying that human rights protect criminals? The reaction I got was always, oh yeah. <laughs> Every time we give a talk, every time we give a presentation, any time we even put out a poster with the word human rights on it, um, we get this criticism back. Don't you know human rights will only protect criminals? Um, so they're very well aware of this. And I think it's really interesting that domestic, a number of domestic human rights groups um, in Guatemala, so groups like GAM, um, which is the Grupo de Apoyo Mutuo, like the mutual support group, um, they were founded to deal with the human rights abuses of the Civil War and to support um, surviving family members of people who've been killed in the Civil War. And they've actually shifted some of their advocacy efforts to work on crime um, and to work with crime victims today. Um, so it's very interesting. Like They're running a support program, for example, for the widows of bus drivers who've been shot and killed in Guatemala City. And to the international community, this is not, these are not people we think of as victims of human rights um, abuses today, uh, because they're, the murderers of these people's husbands were, were common crime. Um, if you want to call it that. But some of these domestic human rights groups have pivoted um, and are sort of starting to work on kind of crime as a human rights issue, or they're trying to, um, the discourse that a lot of them will use is, or they're trying to promote, is the idea of democratic security. Um, that, you know, well-functioning democratic state, we can protect everyone's rights. Um, and so that's like sort of their preferred um, term that they're promoting. And I mean, some of them have even gotten involved. Um, so even Helen Mack, for example, um, Miramax, sister, who runs one of the most prominent uh, human rights groups in Guatemala City, uh, became the commissioner for police reform for a period of time. Um, so domestic groups are very involved with issues of um, sort of policing and crime and some extent uh, sort of crime victims' rights. Um, international groups, not at all, uh, as far as I can tell. So if you look at recent publications, um, I haven't yet done interviews with them. Um, I'm interested in potentially expanding as part of the project also. You know, if you guys find it interesting, and you recommend that? Uh, but based on the publications, um, really do not seem to be aware of this uh, based on the informal conversations with people who work in international um, sort of international NGOs that are active in Guatemala. Uh, they seem blindsided um, when I've mentioned this entire critique of human rights that they protect criminals. And I think there are a few reasons why uh, they might systematically be sort of ignoring this issue or downplaying it, uh, at least in our publications that I've looked at so far. Uh, so the first is um, that the international Sort of human rights advocacy community in Latin America was historically focused on limiting the power of the state. Um, so reining in abusive states, <laughs> um, you know, stopping excess you know, police <coughs> detentions, illegal detentions. Um, and so it would be very contrary um, sort of to their founding ideals to ever be put in a position to say, no, you should strengthen policing, um, like we should be working on police reform. I think that would be sort of a hard move um, for them to make. Not impossible, but not something maybe they're sort of inclined um, naturally to do. And then a second possible reason is that um, most international human rights groups have historically focused on negative rights uh, rather than positive or affirmative rights. So by negative rights I mean freedom, or freedom from, so freedom from abuse, uh, rather than positive rights. Uh, because in, uh, for example, the ICCPR, there is a right to justice actually. Um, the people who've been the victims of crimes, it's very explicitly stated, um, theoretically have the right to judicial redress um, for the crimes against them. But this kind of promoting positive or affirmative actions by states has not historically been um, the focus of the international human rights community. Um, so I will leave it at that and take your questions. Thank you. Thank you. This was super interesting. Um, I know you don't want to take a stance on the rightness or wrongness of the state, some of the statements that you showed. Oh no, I think some of them are totally wrong. Uh, <laughs> okay, I'm completely happy to say that. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe maybe you can then just reply to. Um, I'm going to play devil's advocate uh -huh. a bit. Um, couldn't you make the argument that 
so let me start over. So what you've shown here, you've really framed as perceptions and misunderstandings and, and a lack of knowledge about, about the way things happen or are supposed to happen. But couldn't you also make the argument that there are, there's more than a grain of truth to, to a lot of what these individuals have, have said based on their personal experience and then based on some, some other evidence that we have. So I'm thinking of um, three pieces of evidence in particular. Um, coming out of Colombia, I'm not going to remember the name, but I can get, can get it for you. Um, we know that insurgents in Colombia know precisely the maximum number of people they can kill in a given village and what behaviors they can and cannot do in order to avoid attracting human rights um, observers, human rights attention. So that to me is evidence that criminals are indeed manipulating, or what we were going to call criminals, indeed manipulating the system and, and are really protected by human rights if you look at it that way. Um, I'm also thinking about, you had a, a commentary up there that was about, um, someone had mentioned there's there's rape and there's crime and where's the justice for the victims. I'm just putting myself in that person's perspective and thinking about the domestic abuse epidemic in Guatemala and how, um, you're going to know about more about this than I do, but my understanding is that women can get refugee status in the U.S. because the state has been deemed completely negligent, um, almost turning a blind eye to the problem. Um, and so that, in light of that, that comment I mean, to me, that sounds like that's that person's actual experience, and that may not be actually a misperception or a misunderstanding of how things actually happen or are supposed to happen. That's what is happening. <laughs> that is the truth of what is happening. Um, and it does, in that sense, make it seem like the state is really paying more attention to, to the criminal side of it. Um, and the last piece, and this is a bit more removed, but I'm putting myself in the, in the state's position relative to human rights and I'm thinking about what incentives they might have to to be weary of taking these these cases to, to full prosecution um, and I wonder if human rights uh, I'm sorry if international funding based on human rights records has anything to do with that so my understanding is that from the US uh, a lot of the states to whom we give funding and it's based on showing improvement <laughs> in human rights um, protections. And I wonder if that makes the, ju the judicial system scared, for lack of a better word, to not only enact human rights, but to do it wrong, or to prosecute criminals in the incorrect way. And so when we talk about people being able to get out of the system, and the system's kind of loosey-goosey, and no one really knows how to do it, I wonder if there is some incentive to Maybe incentive isn't the right word, but there is some hesitation to to try and prosecute someone in a system that they know is flawed, in which that is then going to reflect poorly on their protection of human rights. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So those are really good questions. Um, yeah. I should also say, just like as a general comment, that um, sort of as a matter of ideology or kind of interpretation, I do just personally disagree with sort of a lot of what people said. But that said, I take what they're saying as their experience. Um, so I didn't mean to be sort of like belittling or critiquing their own ability to express their own experience, which is actually, um, you know, that, that would be kind of totally contrary to like the entire approach to my project and everything else I've done. So uh, the, the sort of broader point is well taken. Um, but uh, so I think we'll go sort of in reverse here. So you, were, you kind of ended up with a question about Essentially, I think you're asking whether the state would be afraid of or concerned about prosecuting people you know, in ways that aren't in accordance with like international standards of due process or you know, in ways that might be seen as violating the rights of people who are accused of crimes because then they might lose some of their international funding. Um, so I think it's really important to note that uh, historically there have been a lot of problems with um, prosecution, overzealous prosecution in uh, Guatemala are sort of false or trumped up charges. So, you know, when I say, oh, human rights groups have historically been working to rein in abusive states, uh, that's basically Guatemala or, you know, uh, uh, similar states that I'm talking about. Um, and so there is a real, um, you know, there's a real problem with, I'm certainly not saying that, like, without sort of appropriate procedures in place, they should just be aggress aggressively um, prosecuting people, you know, without respecting um, due process. It's definitely not what I'm saying. And there would be 
really the possibility for a lot of people's rights being abused, um, you know, in that kind of scenario. In terms of losing international funding, um, yeah, absolutely, Guatemala's international funding, especially from the U.S., is tied to its human rights performance. Um, they tend to be a little bit more concerned about uh, not so much, well, so if they started rampantly prosecuting criminals in ways that, or alleged criminals in ways that were illegal <laughs> um, or not protecting the rights, I think that would be a problem. Um, more generally, though, up to the present, the U.S. has been more concerned with um, Guatemala's performance in sort of human rights trials. Um, so, for example, the whole fiasco with the Rios Mont trial, um, just in, I think it was December of this last year, so December 2014, the U.S. basically made further aid to Guatemala conditional on retrying Rios Mont domestically. Um, and Guatemala is very upset about this, and you know, foreign diplomats are sitting in on the trial, and Guatemalan government is accusing them of meddling in their justice system, which, well, I don't know, maybe the U.S. is, but <laughs> whether that's for better or worse, um, it's a matter of interpretation of whose side you're on. Um, and then they've also, it's a really interesting change, actually, that um, the U.S. government has told the Guatemalan government, um, again, that their future aid is conditional on getting the military out of policing in the country. This is shocking to me, and the Guatemalan government has said that it will go along with it. And like militarized <coughs> policing is an entire program that they have been promoting, pursuing, and expanding for the last 10 years. And supposedly in 2016, um, the military, I mean, so soldiers right now patrol the streets of Guatemala in camouflage, um, carrying out policing. And the civil police actually transfer some of their budget to the military to hire soldiers to go out and do policing for them, um, which is really problematic and totally violates the peace accords, for example. But there's no domestic actor that can really, there's no domestic opposition that's organized um, to stop this. And so it's actually the US government that has sort of finally stepped up and said, no, you actually have to stop doing this or else we're going to cut off your aid. So aid conditionality remains a real issue. Um, and yeah, I think it's possible if there were really problematic prosecutions, it would be a problem for them. Um, so I'll get to that in a second. So you had two other points here. Um, yeah, the point that like the state actually doesn't serve many victims, including especially um, victims of domestic violence. Absolutely true. Totally, absolutely true. <laughs> um, so, you know, the sense that people have when they're the victim of violent crime, that they're sort of um, all alone, absolutely very valid. Um, people are often re victimized, uh, and not just in sort of an emotional trauma sense. Um, I mean, when I worked at the embassy, <laughs> so bringing it up a little bit. Um, I mean, there was there were some cases that I worked on. Like we would respond to um, American citizens who were victims of violent crimes, and there was one particular case where someone called the police after being the victim of a violent crime, and then was raped by the police after calling them. Um, so, yeah, victims' rights are sort of a big um, problem, um, especially for women. And then um, I don't know as much about the example from Colombia that you mentioned, so I think maybe we can talk about it afterwards or something. Yeah, totally picks up on, on Rebecca's comments and question. Um, first of all, really fascinating talk, really depressing. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, there, I don't know if you, you didn't, I, I know you didn't mean this to because you then said so in, in response to her, but there's a sense of when you present all these quotes and read them, and there's a sense of kind of they're dupes. They're kind of, oh. they've been misled, they've been, you know, they don't know the, re, you know, but then, some of the stuff you showed at the very end suggests, you know, there's, there's again, this not just kernel of truth, but yeah. real truth. And yeah. um, I guess not, the background of this is a totally broken criminal justice system, mm -hmm. which I don't think, I mean, some of the stuff you said suggests that, but you didn't really talk about that. And so basically for human rights to have positive meaning in people's minds, they're codified in laws. And then there has to be evidence that the laws are actually carried out in a just manner. In the context of a broken criminal justice system where it's utterly corrupt and the people get off basically are buying their way out or manipulating, there's a lot more truth to what they're saying than what you're suggesting. So I'm just, you want to? Yeah, no, the point's well taken. Um, and I will say that part of the, <laughs> part of the reason I use the phrase kernel of truth um, Actually, especially having spent sort of a lot of time with people that I'm interviewing, I definitely don't think they're dupes, don't want it to come across that way, and um, think that their views are, you know, things they believe based on their own experiences. Um, I will say that I had presented some of this material at a conference before, and 
emphasized a little bit more some of the connections to reality and got screamed at and swear, I was actually sweared at in a con academic conference. And um, so I'll say that I'm, I'm sort of playing around with the right level of uh, not wanting to seem like I actually think human rights only protect criminals. Uh, but at the same time, recognizing that for the people expressing these views, for them, there are valid and very concrete experiences that have led them to think this. Um, so it's sort of a fine balance and may have to do with the mix of anthropologists and political scientists you, in the room, I'm not sure. You, you might want to talk about that up front <laughs> in your talk about uh -huh. the politics and sensitivity of the language. And, uh, yeah, yeah, nobody wants to see something presented that suggests that people who are the beneficiaries of a lot of human rights um, advocacy don't themselves like human rights. Um, it's kind of a funny, you know, it almost makes it sound like I'm saying the international human rights community should walk away from Guatemala and throw its hands up. And that's actually not really what I want to be saying uh, at all, but thank you. Um, okay, I think I'll start over here and then sort of work my way around. Well, I thought one of the most interesting was the slide where you talked about the domestic and the international human rights mm -hmm. groups yeah. and how they distinguished. And so you're speaking here to, let's say for the sake of argument, a crowd that here's Guatemala and you have your list at the beginning. Let's say we're more serious than just tourists. We think human rights. What a wonderful thing. It would be even worse without. And to hear that anybody doesn't believe that is, it, it seems troubling, to say the least. But then you pointed out what, how the, the, the people there were reacting to this. And I can't believe that an anthropologist is now asking a political scientist for more comparative stuff. But I'm wondering, where does this come from in terms of the violence, the murders, all that, and how does it compare to other places that you can think of in Latin America, for instance? I mean, drugs you mentioned in passing, but it would seem to me that in addition to the broken judiciary, which you find in a lot of different places, you have the drug wars. You have the drugs being ferried through, and I'm wondering whether that doesn't feature very prominently. And then a completely different question. You didn't, and this is the anthropologist again in me, you go in as an American, mm -hmm. and I don't know how much you used or didn't even mention the fact that you used to work for the government. But how did that figure in, in terms of how people responded to you? If you never said you worked for the government, why not? Mm -hmm. All these kinds of things. Yeah. Um, OK, so the first first point, I think you're, um, I'll sort of take the comment that it's interesting, I guess, to think about the international domestic uh, human rights communities. Um, so where does the violence come from? How did the judiciary get so broken? How does this relate to drugs? I mean, it's the 5,000 5, yeah. murders a year. Is that higher than it was 20 years ago, even? Oh, yeah. Um, okay, so, then something right. is developing beyond. It was a broken judiciary right, 20 years right, ago. Right, right, right. So I'll say, so a few things. Um, I mean, first of all, broken judiciary can encompass a lot of different systems in Latin America. Um, I mean, the degree to which sort of policing and judiciary is broken in Guatemala is a little unusual, um, even compared to the rest of Latin America. So. Um, you know, like for example, much higher, I don't remember the statistic off the top of my head, but a much higher percentage of homicides, for example, in Mexico are actually solved. Um, and so both the rates of violent crime and the impunity, and not saying, like, that's a lot, right? You know, that's sufficient, sufficient in Mexico, but I'm just saying that um, comparatively, Guatemala is probably along with Honduras, um, like one of the sort of highest crime and least capability states, so in terms of um, law enforcement and the judiciary. El Salvador, for example, has considerably more uh, resources and professionalization. Um, very high crime rates also, but you even notice the difference. If you go into a police station in El Salvador, people have vehicles, uh, the vehicles have gas. I mean, police stations in Guatemala um, often don't have a working telephone. Uh, they, their vehicles often don't have gas. That is just the most common thing. You're talking to the police, and they'll say, rural police. Um, but they're all federal, but they're assigned to rural towns. Um, and they'll say, oh yeah, you know, we got a call last week, but look, there's no gas, so we can't even drive anywhere um, to go investigate it. So just very, 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 um, low capacity and where, where drugs and high level international organized crime do fit in are sort of the incentives for uh, people in the judiciary and in the police. So in terms of threats to people's daily well-being, with the exception of a few places in Guatemala where there are sometimes pitched gun battles between narco trafficking groups, um, it's usually quite targeted violence um, that results from narco trafficking. And you know, when when we talk about 5,000, 6,000 murders a year, um, 
there's really no information available about them. So people sometimes do research in Mexico and oh, you can sort of triangulate based on newspaper reports which murders are drug violence and which ones aren't. Um, it would be really very difficult to do that for Guatemala. Like the news reporting for most of these um, homicides is body found by road. The end. <laughs> um, you know, we know very little about uh, what it is that has happened. But um, I mean, I will say that I had some variation in the degree of organized crime activity in the different regions where I was doing my research. In eastern Guatemala, there is quite a bit of narco trafficking, um, and there was some sort of intermediate level, you know, not not, not like the international cartels, but um, some local landowners who were involved in narco trafficking in one of the municipalities. And one of the municipalities is one of these places that has a very high local homicide rate. Um, and this is. In, in the book project, actually, but people felt very safe. Um, right, this is. Oh, because if they weren't involved, they weren't going to Exactly. Yeah, 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 it's like a high risk, high reward proposition. It's like very story. targeted. Um, whereas, so, but so the bigger impact, I think, like for this story that I'm telling today from um, sort of drugs and organized crime is actually in making police fearful to do their job um, and deterring judges from ex even accepting posts. So there's some regions of the country where it's very difficult to get someone to agree to be a judge. Uh, because they're likely to get killed, <laughs> which then makes it difficult to comply with international standards um, due process and things when you arrest someone, because how can you bring them before a judge when there is no judge? Um, and there is no judge because people are concerned about organized crime quite reasonably. Um, and also for police, um, I mean, police, are, they don't get trained as units, they're constantly getting transferred around the country, and so it makes it very difficult for them to assess like the local organized crime situation when they've gotten sent to a new municipality. So the most reasonable thing for them to do is actually to do nothing. Um, and just like protect themselves, hide in the police station, and not investigate any crimes, because what if that one crime is related to you know, organized crime and they can retaliate against them? Um, so I think it does have some of these institutional effects, but the type <coughs> so of the explosion of violence that um, people are more concerned about is often um, gang violence, and you know, people's perception of gang violence is, um, there's a quote from sort of a chapter from from Benson and Fisher, who are anthropologists, they talk about how gang members loom larger than life um, over the countryside. And so people are really maybe less concerned than they should be about narco trafficking locally and much more concerned about gangs, um, maras, marreros, um, very, very concerned um, about that type of crime. And then, uh, sort of, how did I identify myself, you know, being American or non American? Um, so, in the, so I still know people in Guatemala City uh, from the time like when I worked in the embassy. So they obviously know that I worked in the embassy. <laughs> and, um, and one of the biggest problems is that I've worked in the consular section and people want visas. And people still want visas. Um, and I occasionally ran into people I'd interview for visas because I interviewed you know, like 15,000 people and it's not, not that big of a country. Um, so, yeah, so for that reason, when I was in the municipalities, like the rural municipalities where I do my research, I didn't want people to think that I could give them visas now, because I, mean, I really, at this point, have no connection to the U.S. government and can't do anything to get them visas. Um, and the whole visa thing is just, like, you know, a wormhole. Um, and so I did not specifically tell people that I'd worked at the U.S. Embassy. Um, I was also concerned about people thinking that I was somehow involved with DEA um, or CC, which is this international institution. Um, I mean, the only sort of targeted threat to my security was when somebody thought, they actually thought I was Spanish, which doesn't really make any sense, um, you know, based on the way I talk, but they thought that I was a Spaniard working for CC and investigating organized crime, um, and so some like local narco traffickers who were therefore not happy. I was able to convince them that I was not Spanish, <laughs> like did not work for CC, and I had the mayor's phone number, and like we resolved the whole problem. Um, I mean, so basically, the way I presented myself was that I originally had gone to about 25 municipalities um, when I was choosing the case sites, and I talked to like a pretty good array of local leaders there. So the mayors, who usually know everyone and everything, including any organized crime actors that are in the area. Um, that was critical to have like the permission and support of the mayor to do a project there that had something to do with crime and security. Um, teachers were very helpful, you know, people at schools, they tend to know a lot of people um, in their communities, and then religious leaders, so both evangelical pastors and um, Catholic church, and I was very careful not. Some people um, sort of historically have gone about research in Guatemala, especially through like introductions facilitated um, by the Catholic church often. And you know, today the population is pretty evenly divided in a lot of communities um, between Catholics and Evangelicals. So I tried. To, I just went to all the churches all the time. <laughs> um, and uh, right. So then the way I presented myself, um, usually university student, um, American university student doing a thesis. 
uh, one of, people are familiar with anthropologists, because there are a lot of anthropologists that do research in Guatemala, <coughs> so usually even my consent, like my verbal consent script, I usually say, oh, I'm a political, you know, political science student, it's kind of like being an anthropologist or a sociologist, <laughs> nobody's heard of political scientists there, um, but there are a lot of anthropologists running around, um, so people understand the idea of, oh, you're doing research about communities, um, you're doing research, people understand the idea of doing a thesis, um, people were much more confused when I went back in Guatemala and tried to explain that I work at MIT, and they could not piece together like what I'm doing at a technical institute. And you know, I've actually now asked for <laughs> permission to just say I'm at a you know like a university in Cambridge uh, when I introduce myself in the future because it was just too mm. confusing. Um, yeah, and then I mean, obviously, people would know that I was American. Um, they would sometimes ask, you know, why do you know so much about Guatemala? Or um, like they would try to piece together their own stories about how this happened. So I mean, I would usually just this is something like Libby Wood told me, just go vague. Um, vague but true. <laughs> so I'd usually say, I lived here before. Um, and they would often leave it at that. Or I would say, you know, they say, where? I'd say, I lived in the capital. They'd often leave it at that. Um, and then if they really pushed, they'd say, you know, what were you doing? I'd just say, oh, I worked for US government. They sent me here. And they usually wouldn't, they would usually assume that I was in the Peace Corps that I was a secretary or something. Like they, I never really had anybody, but what were you doing? What were you doing? Um, and yeah, or one of the other common stories that people would concoct was that I had a Guatemalan parent. That was another real common one. Like, oh, you're from the U.S., but you speak Spanish really well, and you kind of sound like a Guatemalan, sort of, so it must be that you have one Guatemalan parent in the U.S., and that's, like, where your connection is. I never told people that. I corrected them, but that was what, like, the story a lot of people came up with. Um, okay. Yeah, I guess I'm, um, I'm curious to know, you didn't talk much about people who do support human rights, um, or about the um, variation across the communities in which you did the field work. And uh, I'm asking this in part because while I don't know about questions in survey data on human rights, I know or have some familiarity with the questions on vigilantism in LAPOP. And um, what you see, if I remember correctly, if you think of vigilantism and support for vigilantism as the flip side or the mirror image of, of human rights, um, is you know half of Guatemalans are critical of vigilantism, um, which isn't enough, I think, but it's still a lot. Um, and then at the same time, those numbers skew enormously on the indigenous Ladino axis, with you know, Ladinos being only about half as supportive of vigilantism as indigenous people. So mm -hmm. Given that one of your communities is indigenous and the others aren't, I'm wondering, you know, is there variation that's systematic that you see? And if so, what does it look like? Yeah, it's interesting. And then, um, so I'm still playing around with some of the most recent LAPOP data. Um, and you know, there are some really good questions that are relevant that I'm actually trying to incorporate more into the revised version of my dissertation um, for the book project. And um, yeah, this whole correlation between sort of support for vigilantism, where lynchings, what we mean by vigilantism, um, where lynchings happen, if that's what we mean by vigilantism, and indigenous population, um, it's kind of messy. And like my dissertation <coughs> project, I would argue that it actually has a lot to do with the Civil War. Um, so I mean, Civil War targeted indigenous people, so there's like, this correlation between indigenous population and wartime violence, and then you get these um, there's sort of correlations between views about vigilantism and where lynchings happen um, after the war. Now, I was actually surprised. Um, I mean, that said, so I have you know one majority indigenous towns in Jalapa, and you know part of the reason I ended up choosing that town, like all the variation here was chosen for the dissertation project, not for this particular project. Um, but I chose that town because it's majority indigenous and was not significantly affected by the civil war. Um, and then there's uh, like a majority Ladino town in Hutiapa, and then there's a majority indigenous town. So I should say that some of the uh, some of the people, I mean about half the people from Kiche that we saw here are not themselves indigenous. Um, so there is even there like a pretty loud and vocal non-indigenous um, elite. And something I talked about in the dissertation project is that there are some of these lynchings that get coded as indigenous lynchings there, because like Minugua um, basically came up with this data set of lynchings, which is the UN mission, the UN verification mission in Guatemala. And they have this data set, which I think is a little questionable, but they basically say, like, here's, all, here's a bunch of lynchings that have happened. Are they indigenous lynchings or not? Um, and their sort of decision rule is, did it happen in a majority indigenous municipality? And if yes, then they put down indigenous lynching, uh, which is, you know, how they categorize some of the lynchings um, in this particular town where I was doing the research. And, I mean, I didn't present any of this here, but, like, in the other project, um, you know, I talk about, like, I go through very carefully the very first lynching that ever happened in that town and talk to people very concretely, like who was there, you know, who started it. Um, it was the Ladinos. It was the Ladino minority in this majority indigenous town who were the main instigators of the first lynching there. Um, so, anyhow, so it's kind of an aside about like the indigenous Ladino question. Um, in terms of variation across the towns, though, 
I was surprised how little variation there was on the views about human rights. Um, so I definitely, like, you know, I talked about another project. Um, there are, I definitely think that there are differences in the way people go about vigilantism. Um, so, like, in eastern Guatemala, people are not generally doing things that are collective um, and public and, like, performative in the way that they're doing in the West. Um, doesn't mean there's not vigilantism. It just means that it doesn't necessarily register when you ask the type of question. Um, and it's not, like, quite as visible as the lynchings that are happening. Um, so this kind of general attitude, like, two of the most common, most consistent attitudes that I found were distrust of the police. Um, I mean, I literally, so people will sometimes say, oh, the reason there are lynchings in the West is because people don't trust the police, or indigenous people don't trust the police, or something. Nobody trusts the police. <laughs> um, the lady knows in Eastern Guatemala had the exact same complaints about the police that um, people, you know, in Western Guatemala did. So that was very constant. And then, um, like, the critique of human rights and the basic variance of the critique about human rights that I was presenting here were very constant across the two places, which was quite surprising to me, actually. Um, and then in terms of people who do support human rights, you know, it's interesting, I mean, maybe I should go through and sort of tally this up, although it's not any kind of, like, representative sample, so it doesn't mean anything, but, um, you know, just thinking back to the interviews, I would say that at least a third of people, like a third to half, had some kind of mixed view about human rights. So, you know, I, I had a few quotes that had sort of this flavor where people will start out and they'll say, oh, human rights are magnificent. Um, you know, human rights are great in theory, but then, like, in practice here, it's not working so well. There's usually a but somewhere in there. So people's views are a little bit um, nuanced. I mean, the areas where, you know, I didn't really present this as much, um, the areas where people seemed, when they were discussing, to be the most supportive of the idea of human rights was, like, social and economic rights. Um, so it's almost like they've leapt over the first generation rights and gone straight to the second, second generation. That's a lot less controversial to say people have a right to health care, people have a right not, you know, to be living in extreme poverty. Um, you know, to the extent that stuff came up in my interviews, it was not very controversial. Um, but to say that, like, criminals have a right to due process is a very controversial statement. Thank you for your presentation. So I was wondering if you could uh, tell us who benefits from this kind of discourse. Uh, it seems to me that law enforcement institutions might actually benefit from this idea. I mean, you have a, you have a case of basically state failure, and uh, you need to explain somehow the fact that you're not able to uh, catch and prosecute criminals. And it would seem to me that this goes very well uh, with that, but I don't know. Uh, and so then perhaps uh, for your future survey um, projects, maybe to see if there's like a correlation between trust in law enforcement institutions and uh, belief in this uh, uh, attitude, basically. So I was just wondering if you could talk about that. Yeah, so it's interesting. You um, kind of reasoned your way to a point that some of my interviewees in Guatemala City actually made. Um, I mean, I didn't present it here. But some of them actually sort of criticized, well, there are a lot of reasons you can criticize uh, Guatemalan law enforcement. But one of their criticisms was that police officers um, or prosecutors, sometimes when they're trying to explain why they haven't solved a case or they haven't arrested anyone or they weren't successful in prosecuting them, they'll say, oh, we couldn't catch this person because human rights were tying our hands. Um, so this whole, you know, there are active proponents of this um, explicit discourse, uh, which sometimes include people in law enforcement. I mean, it's not a blanket statement. There are also people in law enforcement who totally disagree with this. Uh, but sometimes that does come up. Um, I mean, the other main, I would say, beneficiaries are, you know, to the extent that there is any um, ideological coherence to Guatemalan political parties, uh, sort of more right-wing parties, um, or military-affiliated parties, uh, because they'll, this is what the other project is about, is about parties that will, um, you know, some, some candidates um, in Guatemala will make explicit references to their own past human rights abuses as a qualification for holding office. Um, so, like in the domestic, he didn't do this very much internationally, but like in um, the domestic media during his presidential campaign, um, Otto Perez Molina, it was very interesting that he was domestically referred to as El General, El General, you know, the general, the general. And that's how the person um, in the one interview here that I showed uh, was referring to him. And, Oh, with his domestic advertisements, he'd be in his military uniform, you know, old pictures of himself. Um, I mean, he was an on-the-ground commander in the East Shield Triangle, which is where the genocide happened, when the genocide happened. Um, so he's fairly directly implicated. Um, he was in some other military intelligence units that have, you know, been involved in um, some very problematic human rights cases. And he would actually say things, I mean, I saw one television interview with him in Guatemala, um, this was on domestic television, uh, where he was explicitly pointing to his role in the genocide, well he didn't call it that exactly, but in you know the saving of the country, um, as qualifying him to fight gang members today. 
Um, so this is something that people, you know, there's actually a situation like if you think that, you know, force is the way to get things done and human rights are making you unsafe, then it can actually make sense to vote for someone who is a past human rights abuser and might um, sort of play fast to with the rules in the future. So I think that's another um, sort of set of people who benefit from this. I think we have time for one more question. Okay, well, there's, um, I see two, maybe I'll let you guys group and then I'll sort of try to address it quickly. Sure, so I think this might have already been answered to some extent, but it seems like the question of whether these people's views are valid hinges on the empirical question of what is the contribution of these human rights <coughs> groups or regulations on the actual impunity that we observe. I imagine that's a really hard question to answer, but I was wondering what your thought on that is. I have just a couple of short questions. Uh, one you partially addressed earlier. Uh, when it comes to uh, continued aid to Guatemala being dependent on progress in, in human rights, uh, is that pro does that progress include uh, improvements in uh, positive rights like the right to redress, or is it uh, exclusively ne negative rights? And the other question is, uh, is there a perception that back under the, the dictadura that state violence was more uh, predictable despite things like the abuse of, uh, of state power or uh, false prosecutions uh, than privatized violence is now? And does that perception vary from indigenous to non-indigenous communities? Um. Yeah, so those are really uh, good questions. I'll just give them like the one-line answer because <laughs> I know we're running out of time. Um, so how much do human rights advocates contribute to impunity? I'd say at most, very small drop in the bucket. I mean, the other types of problems that we're talking about are so severe that even if human rights advocates turned around tomorrow and said, we are only going to support crime victims, we're going to push for prosecution of all cases, I mean, I can't really imagine that it would make much difference, you know, kind of playing out the counterfactual. So I think that the substantive contribution is way out of, overblown out of proportion. Um, it's actually a sharp, like, I like the way you phrase this. Um, it's like a, help, a helpful way of clarifying um, some of the things I was saying. Um, okay, so is foreign aid being tied to improvements essentially in like prosecution and law enforcement? Uh, not that I know of. I mean, there are a lot of internationally funded efforts to sort of help um, Guatemalan institutions. You know, police come over from Miami all the time and train the police. I mean, there's a lot of military and police training. Obviously, there's a lot of equipment. Um, there's some interesting, uh, sort of hybrid international institutions like um, CC, maybe we can talk about afterward or something, which is just a really interesting institution. Um, there are a lot of like foreign funded justice centers and things like that. Um, so the, yeah, the, the direction has been not so much to like tie aid to progress, but to try to facilitate progress. Um, the unfortunate thing is that it does create a very uneven sort of landscape of options um, for victims before addressing crimes. So if you're in a particular location and you're the victim of a particular type of crime, there might be some foreign funded, you know, center for victims or something like that. Um, but it's a pretty sparse patchwork. You know, like I know that in Villanueva outside, which is like a suburb of Guatemala City, there is this justice center that USAID runs. It's supposed to be quite good. Um, you know, it's supposed to be a much better experience for people who are able to access that. But it's not really a systemic um, sort of change. Or for example, they've created these large, partially foreign instituted and foreign supported, um, like femicide courts that are supposed to address violence against women, which mm, it's kind of a patchwork approach because, you know, in some ways maybe that one court is operating better, but then you're not really doing anything to address sort of the system-wide problems and all the people who don't have access to that one particular court. Um, the state violence, it really depends who you talk to. So people in Guatemala City, for example, um, which is one of the most random and chaotic and violent places in the country today and was <coughs> affected in a relatively more targeted way by the Civil War, will definitely say, oh, there was less violence during the Civil War, uh, violence was more predictable things like that. If you were in a, a town that was severely affected by the Civil War, um, especially if you were in a group that was the target of like mass indiscriminate violence, people's views would probably be different. Um, but you know, so it sort of depends who you're talking to. Thank you very much.